Hello, everyone. We're going to go through the uh, study guide for the uh, unit two test for honors camp. So let's jump right into it. Number one, sketch particle diagrams of cold versus solid, cold versus hot solids, liquid, and the gases. Uh, so we'll do my solids over here, liquids and gases. So if we're doing cold versus hot, I'll go cold on the left, warm on the right. So for solids, we want to show the particles somewhat close together uh, in a nice orderly fashion with one whoosh line. And if we're warming it up, we want to show a little bit of thermal expansion where the particles are just a little bit more spaced apart. You know, try not to draw the particles themselves actually bigger. I kind of did that accidentally. Um, but, you know, the, the particles should be the same size, but they should be spread out. Now for whoosh lines, we're going to go with one small whoosh line for the cold and one sort of exaggerated whoosh line for the hot. So that shows that thermal expansion. Um, you know, think of like railroad buckling or uh, the gaps in bridges. For liquid, we're going to show the particles uh, a little more spaced out on the bottom of the container. And I did, let's see, six there. So for warm, I'm going to, again, kind of spread them out. And really, they have only one way to go, which is up with two small whoosh lines on the cold liquid and two more exaggerated whoosh lines on the warmer liquid. So again, we see that thermal expansion. For gases, we're going to show uh, evenly distributed throughout the container for both cold and warm. So I did six there. I'll do another six here. So something like that. Now, really, without whoosh lines or pressure arrows, these are going to be identical. They were both evenly distributed. But the difference is the cold ones are going to get four small whoosh lines. The, the uh, warm ones are going to get four exaggerated whoosh lines. And we do pressure arrows as well. So we're going to do small pressure arrows on the cold and larger pressure arrows on the warm. So that shows that difference. Now remember, when it comes to gases, we only see thermal expansion if it's a flexible container, like a balloon. Uh, in this case, I'm showing a rigid container because it's the same size. So we don't see a volume increase, but we instead see a pressure increase. Question two, unit conversions. So remember, one ATM equals 760 MMHG. MMHG, which also equals 760 TOR. And these conversions are true by definition or they're exact. So we don't need to worry about sig figs for those. Uh, all right, so for the first one, we have 1802 MMHG into TOR. And really, I don't even need to write any more because, well, it's one to one. Well, I mean, if I want to do my conversions, I'm going to do it this way times 760 TOR over 760 MMHG, or really I could just say one TOR over one MMHG. Either way, the units cancel, these numbers cancel, and the answer is obviously just going to be 1802 TOR. And, and that one you could have just done you know, without any math. Second one, ATM to TOR. So here I'm going to do 0 0.0028 ATM. I'm going to multiply this by 760 TOR per one ATM, 0 0.0028 times 760. Now I'm going to go with two sig figs, not because of the 760, that's true by definition, but because of the 0 0.0028, two sig figs there. So I'm going to get an answer of 2.1 tor. And finally, for the last one, 91.2 inches mercury into ATM. And I put a hint there that you can convert inches mercury into millimeters mercury the same way you convert inches to millimeters. So 91.2 inches of mercury, we can go directly into millimeters mercury by using our uh, conversions that we know, like the bridge we use to cross from inches into centimeters. So let's get my inches into centimeters. So that's gonna be times 2.54 centimeters per inch. Now, technically this would be centimeters mercury, which is not a common unit, but theoretically that works per inches mercury. Cancel, cancel. And 10 millimeters mercury per one centimeter mercury. 
This is just like going from inches to millimeters. And now that we have millimeters mercury, we're back in a familiar unit. We can take this into ATM by saying 1 ATM over 760 mmHg. Let's see here, mmHg cancels mmHg. So 91.2 times 2.54 equals, times 10 equals, divided by 760 equals. Uh, and now I'm gonna go three sig figs because uh, my starting point, okay, the, the 10 millimeters per centimeter, that's true by definition. So is the 1 ATM over 760. So with three sig figs, 3.05 ATM. Okay. Number three, what is the molar mass of propane gas, C3H8? So you're gonna use a periodic table for this. Basically, we're gonna do three carbons and eight hydrogens. So carbon is 12.01 times three. And hydrogen is 1.01 times eight. And we add those together. In fact, just to be nice and thorough, I'll show the workout here. So I could do this in my head. That's gonna be 36.03. And that's gonna be 8.08. .08. And now we add these together. And I should be able to do this one here. So that's a one and that's a 36 and a 44. I'm just, I'm, I am gonna double check on the calculator. 12.01 times three plus 1.01 times eight. Yeah, so 44.11. And uh, the unit for this is grams per mole. And uh, you know, another way I like to write this is that one mole of C3H8 equals 44.11 grams. And that way you can use that in conversion factors. Question four, how many cobalt atoms are in a 3.25 kilogram block of pure cobalt? So number of atoms, well, what do we know about the number of atoms, like number of? Well, we know the mole, right? We know that one mole of anything equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that thing. So in this case, a mole of cobalt is gonna be that many cobalt atoms. What else do we know about cobalt? Well, from the periodic table, which I hopefully have a copy of. Yes, I do. From the periodic table, we know the molar mass of cobalt is 58.93 grams. So 58.93 grams equals one mole uh, for cobalt. So this is really just a conversion factor problem. Okay, so we start with 3.25 kilograms of cobalt. Now notice you are gonna have to turn that into grams because molar mass, the number on the periodic table is based in grams, not kilograms. So times a thousand grams per kilogram, cancel, cancel. And that'll give us grams of cobalt. I can go grams into moles. So I'm gonna use this factor up here. I'm gonna say one mole per, 58.93 grams. And if I solved it out, this would give me the number of moles. But I'm not gonna solve it out. I'm gonna jump right into number of atoms. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, oops, 23rd atoms per mole. You can abbreviate mole M-O-L. I just, I'm not even sure why I wrote it out. I normally don't. All right, these all cancel. We should be able to get our answer. 3.25 times 1,000 equals, divided by 58.93 equals, times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And checking our sig figs, looks like I'm gonna go with three sig figs because of this. Uh, 3.32 times 10 to the 25th atoms. So that's how many cobalt atoms are in 3.25 kilograms of cobalt. Number five, what's the volume of a steel tank of gas that contains 975 grams of carbon monoxide at a temperature of 19 Celsius and a pressure of 250 point PSI? So this sounds a lot like a gas problem, right? Like a gas law problem. So the question is which gas law, combined or ideal? Well, remember the combined gas law is used when you have a change, you know, a starting temperature, final temperature, or a starting volume, final volume. Ideal gas law is used when you don't have a change. And in this problem, nothing's changing. 
So I'm going to use the ideal gas law PIVNERT, PV equals NRT. Oops. PV equals NRT. All right, now what are we solving for? Uh, well, we're solving for volume. So let's get that right out of the way. So V is going to equal NRT over P. So let's see what we have. Uh, we need N, which is number of moles. Does it give us moles? No. But what does it give us that we can turn into moles? Grams. It gives us the grams of carbon monoxide. So we're going to turn that, I'll just say turn into moles. And that's going to go in for N. R, does it give us R? No, but we always know R. We don't need to be given R. R is 0.0821 liters atmospheres over moles Kelvin. Temperature, does it give us that? Yes, it does. But is it ready to go? No, because when you use the ideal gas law, temperature must be in Kelvin. And finally, pressure. It gives us pressure, 250 PSI. Is that ready to go? No, because you have to use ATM in the ideal gas law. That's assuming you're using our ideal gas constant of 0.0821. So we're going to do some conversions. Then we're going to plug in and solve for our answer. All right, so first of all, we're going to take 975 grams of carbon grams of carbon monoxide and turn this into moles. So we're going to need to use the molar mass of this. So carbon is 12.01 plus oxygen, which is 16.00. And the number I get is 28.01. Again, let's put that in context. What is that? Is that the grams that equals one mole or is that the moles that equals one gram? Well, it's the grams that equals one mole. So I'm going to multiply this by one mole over 28.01 grams. Some people just memorize that if you want to go from grams to moles, you divide by molar mass. If you want to go from moles to grams, you multiply. I like to think of it as a conversion factor, so there's no memorizing anything. It's the number of grams that equals one mole. Anyway, 975 over this gives me 34.8. moles of CO, and that is N. We know R, T is going to be 19 degrees Celsius. We're going to add 273. Now, I don't even need to worry about the 0.15 because that would be rounded off anyway. So if I get a whole number Celsius, I'm just going to get a, use a, a whole number 273 for that. 19 plus 273 gives me 292 Kelvin. And for P, 250 point PSI, that has to be turned into ATM. So it gives us the conversion right there, times one ATM per 14.7 PSI, 250 over 14.7, 17.006. So with two, three sig figs there, I'm gonna go with 17.0 uh, ATM. And now we have everything we need. So volume is going to equal N, which is 34.8 moles. It's going to be a big tank. R, which is 0.0821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. T, which is 292 Kelvin over P, which is 17.0 ATM. Now, just to make sure I got this all right, let's check our units. Mole cancels mole, Kelvin cancels Kelvin, ATM cancels ATM, I'm left with liters. Does that make sense if we're solving for volume? Yeah. 34.8 times 0.0821 equals, times 292 equals, divided by 17.0 equals, checking sig figs, three sig figs is what I'm going to go with. Because look at the numbers I wrote in black. All of those have three sig figs. Now you might say, hold on a sec, 19 degrees Celsius, isn't that two? Well, we didn't use 19, did we? We used the Kelvin version of that, which is 292. So with three sig figs, my answer is 49.1 liters. Number six, all right, long question. A 39.2 milliliter tank, pretty small tank here, is filled with a gas at 35 degrees Celsius. The tank is warmed up to 70 degrees Celsius. If the starting pressure was 1490 torr, what's the new pressure? Again, sounds like a gas law problem. So which gas law are we using? Well, I noticed that we are warming up a tank and it gives us a starting temperature and a final temperature. So I know that this is gonna be a combined gas law problem. So 
P1, V1, T2, N2 equals P2, V2, T1, N1. Now, if you're looking at that saying, what, that's not the combined gas law. Well, that's a way of writing it. You, you may be used to seeing it this way. P1, V1 over T1, N1 equals P2, V2 over T2, N2. These are mathematically the same. I just like it without the denominators. Makes it a little easier, in my opinion. All right, now with the combined gas law, we can get rid of anything that's held constant. So temperature is changing. We're solving for the pressure. What does it tell you about volume? It gives you the starting volume, but notice it doesn't say a final volume. And in fact, I say it's a tank, which is kind of a hint that it's not going to change. So you can actually get rid of both volumes because it's not changing. I know it gives you starting volume, but it doesn't give you final, so it's not changing. Now, if you want, you can plug in 39.2 milliliters as V1 and also plug the same thing in as V2, and you'd end up canceling them out anyway. So I'm just gonna get rid of them now. Volume's not changing, take V out of there. What else doesn't get mentioned? Number of moles. It doesn't say anything about a leak or anything like that. So I'm gonna get rid of N1 and N2. So this ends up giving us just Pressure and temperature changing here. Uh, let's see, we're solving for the new pressure. So the new pressure is gonna be P2 and uh, we need to get T1 out of here. So it's gonna end up being P1 T2 over T1. That's my formula. All right, now there's only one rule when it comes to this gas law and that's that temperature must be in Kelvin. So we're gonna turn 35 into 308. That's by adding 273. And I'm going to turn 70. Ooh, I realize there's a typo here. I'm probably going to change on the sheet. That should be 70 point. I want that to be to the ones place, not the tens place. 70 uh, plus 273 is going to give me 343. Now, technically, if I, if I just kept it as 70, since that's rounded to the tens place, your Kelvin temperature would go down as 340 to the tens place. So I'm going to keep that like that. Uh, all right, pressure, do we have to use ATM for this? No, you can use TOR. And since the question doesn't ask for the new pressure to be reported in any special unit, TOR is fine. So P2 is gonna equal 1490 TOR times T2, which is 343 Kelvin, divided by T1, which is 308 Kelvin. Kelvin cancels Kelvin. I'm left with Tor, which makes sense because that's a pressure unit. 1490 times 343 equals, divided by 308 equals 1659.3. Let's check our sig figs. Looks like three sig figs in each of those temperatures. Because remember, we don't go by the Celsius. We go by the Kelvin because that's what we actually use. And pressure has three. So I'm going to go with 1660. Tor. That's part A. Part B, explain why on the particle level, pressure increases. So notice the pressure went from 1490 up to 1660. Why does that make sense? Well, you should know that pressure is the force of the collisions over the area of the container. Essentially, it's how hard and how often the particles are striking the walls of the container. So what happens when you warm a gas up? Well, it speeds the particles up, which means you're gonna have more collisions and stronger collisions with the walls. So it makes sense that the pressure is gonna increase because you're speeding up the particles. Part C, if the temperature doubled from 35 to 70 degrees, why didn't the pressure double? Well, the answer to that is it, the temperature really didn't double. Celsius is a man-made temperature scale. It doesn't really have any fundamental grounding in, in speed of particles or anything. Uh, only in the Kelvin scale is a doubling of temperature, a true doubling of the speed. So in fact, you can see that we didn't double the temperature. It started at 308 Kelvin and it warmed up to 343 Kelvin. So it only increased in temperature by about 10%. You know, I'm running those numbers in my head. And in fact, that's the same ratio that it went up by. Because really, if you think about it with this formula, it's like the T2 to T1 ratio times the starting pressure. So if it went up by 10%, pressure is gonna go up by 10%. So again, the short answer is because it really didn't double because in the Kelvin, it only went up by a small amount. 
And finally, part D, sketch before and after particle diagrams. All right, so we wanna account for all four factors here. So I'm gonna start with my boxes um, for what the, temp the, the volume did. Well, notice in this problem, the volume didn't change. So I wanna draw two similar size boxes. I'm trying to get those as similar as I can. Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, now we're gonna draw our particles. Now, did the number of particles change? No, they didn't. So we're gonna draw the same number of particles. There's five there, there's five there. Uh, next, we're gonna give whoosh lines. Now, whoosh lines indicate the temperature. So did the temperature change? Yes, we went from uh, 35 to 70, so we warmed up. So I'm gonna do four smaller whoosh lines on the left and four larger whoosh lines on the right. And finally, pressure, pressure arrows. Uh, <clears throat> Did pressure increase? Yes, it did. So I'm gonna do smaller pressure arrows on the left and larger pressure arrows on the right. Okay, so that sketch actually accurately depicts all four factors. <clears throat> Number seven, 40.0 liter weather balloon is released from Earth's surface where the conditions happen to be at STP. You should know what STP is. STP is zero degrees Celsius and one ATM. And that is true by definition, by the way, that's not one sick thing. It rises up to a height at which the temperature is negative 114 Celsius and the pressure is 0.17 atm. What's the new volume? So hopefully by now you realize this is gonna be a combined gas law problem because we are changing things. And in this case, we are changing two things. We are changing the temperature and we're changing the pressure. We're solving for the new volume. So combined gas law, P1, V1, T2, N2 equals, P2, V2, T1, and one. All right, is anything held constant in this problem? Yes, number of particles. It doesn't tell you whether there's any kind of leak or anything. Okay. Now notice in the last two problems, N was constant. It's not always gonna be constant though. The problem might tell you that a certain number of moles are added or subtracted. So don't you know, be ready for that. Uh, what else is constant? Nothing, because we're solving for the new volume and there's a pressure change and a temperature change. So in this case, we're gonna plug in five numbers and solve for the sixth one. All right, we're looking for the new volume. So I'm gonna rearrange for V2. So getting V2 by itself, I need to get P2 and T1 out of there. So I'm gonna divide those. So P1, V1, T2 over P2, T1. Uh, okay, and now we're gonna start plugging in values. Uh, so the starting pressure, well, we're starting at STP, so it's gonna be one ATM. But remember, this is like a perfect infinite sig fig one ATM. So I'm just gonna say 1.00, okay? Now listen, you can also report that as 760 MMHG, 760 TOR, 14.7 PSI, 101,300 Pascals. You can use any pressure unit you want. Why did I choose ATM? Because I noticed that P2 is an ATM. And as long, if you're plugging in P1 and P2, you need them to be in the same unit. Uh, okay, V1 is my starting volume. That's given as 40.0 liters. Uh, T2 is the new temperature, which is negative 114, but you can't plug that in. We have to add 273 to that. Negative 114 plus 273, 159 Kelvin. We divide that by P2, which is the new pressure, 0.17 ATM. And next to that goes T1, which is the starting temperature, which is standard temperature, but you can't plug in zero because it's not really zero. And also you can't divide by zero. Uh, we have to turn that to Kelvin. So 273 and really I'll say 0.15 because I know that's true by definition. All right, let's check our units. Uh, ATM cancels ATM, Kelvin cancels Kelvin. I'm left with liters, which makes sense for volume. All right, 1.00 times 40.0 equals times 159 equals divided by 0.17 equals divided by 273.15 equals checking sig figs. I'm gonna go with two because of that pressure. Final answer of 140 liters, 140. By the way, if you 
got the same setup, but got a drastically different answer. In fact, I can tell you what that answer would be. If you ended up getting something like 10 million liters, that's gonna be way uh, larger than you need. Uh, sorry, smoke alarm went off, but it sounds like a false alarm. We good? That sounds like um, I, I could tell what you did there. That means you divided by 0.17 times 273.15 all at once, okay? But by doing that, you're really telling your calculator to divide by 273.15, or sorry, divide by 0.17, but then multiply by 273.15. Instead, you wanna do it one step at a time or put that in front. Anyway, so that's part A. Part B, if it got colder, why did the balloon expand? It's a good question, right? Because it, it cooled down and when the temperature drops in a flexible container, it should shrink. So why did the balloon expand? Well, it's because the temperature change wasn't the only factor here. The pressure also changed and the pressure dropped. The pressure outside the balloon dropped, which allows the balloon to grow in size. I mean, if you think about it, inside a balloon, there's like a battle happening. There's like a battle. It's the air inside is pushing out and the air outside is pushing in. Now, when you have a regular balloon just sitting at somewhere in the ground level, these arrows are pushing with the same strength, the same pressure, and therefore the balloon stays the same size. Well, if you bring this up into the atmosphere and all of a sudden the atmosphere is pushing with a lot less force, so this arrow gets much smaller, and this arrow gets much smaller, and this arrow gets much smaller, and the air inside is pushing with the same force, what's going to happen to your balloon? Well, it's going to expand. And it's going to expand to the point, and, and as the balloon expands, the pressure inside is going to drop to uh, equalize with the pressure outside. So your balloon is going to end up expanding to offset that pressure. So what's going on in this question is, yes, temperature is decreasing, which should shrink the balloon, but also pressure is increasing, which should grow the balloon. Now, since the balloon ends up growing in size, it tells you that the pressure loss is significantly greater than the temperature gain in percentage point terms. And what I mean by that is, let's look, how much did our pressure drop? It dropped from one ATM down to 0.17. That's more than five times loss. What about our temperature? Our temperature went from, it's not useful looking at Celsius, our temperature went from 273 down to 114. Nope, sorry, that's wrong, down to 159. Which is like a two times drop, it dropped by like half. So the pressure went down five times or so, the temperature went up by two times, notice that the pressure loss offsets the temperature loss. And really it makes sense that the balloon grew by like 2.5 times because well, actually uh, a little more than three, my, my numbers are a little off there. So the, the balloon grew by about three times because of that. Uh, all right, part C, before and after particle diagrams. So uh, let's start with our volume. So our balloon grew in size. So on the left, I'm gonna do a smaller container. On the right, I'm gonna do a larger container. That's my new volume, it's larger. Uh, now I'm gonna draw the particles. Now our number of particles didn't change. So however many you draw on the left, just draw the same on the right. So I'll do, let me just do one more. I'll do five and five like that. Uh, temperature, it got colder. So I, I want larger whoosh lines on the left and smaller whoosh lines on the right. And our pressure, making sure I'm doing this right, our pressure decreased. Yeah, temperature dropped and pressure dropped. So we should have more pressure on the left so I want bigger pressure arrows here and smaller pressure arrows there. Okay, so this one's a little trickier. You gotta think about each one of those. All right, question eight. How many helium atoms are in a 10.0 liter party balloon whose temperature is 21 Celsius and pressure is 0.987 ATM? 
Okay. Uh, well, looks like a gas law problem. Is anything changing? No. So this is going to be a Pivnert problem. PV equals NRT. All right. We're solving for number of helium atoms. So that's going to be N. N is number of particles. However, the N in this formula is not going to give you atoms. It's going to give you moles. So we're going to solve for N, which is going to be moles, and then we're going to convert moles into atoms using Avogadro's number. All right. So let's start working through it. Let's rearrange for N. So we need to divide RT. So N is going to equal PV over RT. Uh, for pressure, we have point. 978 ATM, and that is ready to go. You can plug that right into Pivner because it's an ATM. Volume, 10.0 liters. Again, you can plug it right in. We divide that by R, which is 0 0.0821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. And temperature is 21 Celsius. We have to turn that into Kelvin. So that's going to be 294 Kelvin. Okay, ATM cancels a, oh, ATM, liter cancels liter, Kelvin cancels Kelvin, and I accidentally crossed out the one thing I don't want to, which is moles. So moles does not get crossed out. It's the denominator within the denominator, which means it ends up coming back up to the top as our final unit. 0.978 times 10 equals, divided by 0 0.0821 equals, divided by 294 equals, 0 0.405 moles, and three sig figs looks good with that. All right, but the problem doesn't ask for moles, it asks for number of atoms. Well, that's easy. Since a mole is the same number of everything, it's gonna be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole times 6.022 E23, Three sig figs, final answer, 2.44 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. All right, number nine, conceptual question. Imagine a container of gas. You wanna reduce the pressure inside of it. What three things could you do to it? And explain on the particle level why each of these would reduce the pressure. So uh, I'd say the, the thing that comes to my mind quickly uh, fastest is temperature change. What could you do to reduce the pressure? You can cool it down. So one thing would be if you drop the temperature, the pressure will decrease. Okay, so T down, P down. Uh, now on the particle level, why is this? Well, remember, pressure is all about the force of the collisions on the area of the container. Or in other words, it's how hard and how often the particles are striking the inside walls of the container. So when you, cool, when you cool them down, they're going to move slower, which means they're going to hit the walls less often and less hard. So that's one explanation. What else could you do? Well, you could change the number of particles. You can drop N, which should also drop P. And this is common sense. If you remove some of the air from inside of it, uh, there's going to be fewer particles hitting the walls. So you're going to have fewer collisions and less pressure. And the last thing you can do is influence volume. Now, what could you do to the volume to reduce the pressure? Well, in this case, you want the volume to increase. If V goes up, P is gonna go down. Now, why is that? Well, pressure is all about the force of the collisions exerted over the area of the container. So if you stretch out the area of the container, you're gonna have fewer for collisions per unit area. So for that reason, the pressure is gonna drop. So we see two direct proportions. Temperature pressure is direct, where they move in the same direction. Number of particles and pressure is direct. And we see one inverse proportion, where when one goes up, the other goes down. Question 10, uh, some air pressure demos. So we're explaining the role the, that the atmospheric pressure plays in the following. So first of all, how a straw works. Uh, so I'll do a little sketch here. So here's a cup, here's some liquid. Here's a straw. And when the cup's just sitting in the straw, there's basically anything that the atmosphere is touching, it's exerting atmospheric pressure on. Now, significantly, that means here and here, but also inside the straw. 
And of course, everywhere else, atmosphere is touching the walls, it's touching you, it's touching everything. And it's pushing with a force of 14.7 pounds per square inch on everything that it touches. So what happens when you put your mouth on a straw? So here's, here's now you putting your mouth on the straw and you're starting to use the straw. Now you might think of it as just you're sucking up the liquid, but really what's happening is you're utilizing air pressure here. So what you do is you're reducing the number of particles inside the straw. So if originally this was our setup, notice I'm trying to evenly distribute the air. If you have this uh, even number of particles before and you use the straw to remove air, so let's take away some of these particles inside, you're basically causing the number of particles to drop. Now, how you do that is kind of another step to this, and it relates to breathing. Uh, when you breathe, you expand your lungs, which increases their volume and drops their pressure, and as a result, the air from outside is forced into your lungs. That's really what's happening here. You're essentially breathing the air inside the straw into your body. So you're, you're creating conditions for the air inside the straw to be forced up into your mouth, down your trachea, into your lungs. But anyway, that results in a loss of number of particles, which therefore results in a loss of pressure inside the straw. Now the effect here is that the pressure inside is less. So I'm gonna drop that pressure arrow down quite a little bit. And as a result, the atmosphere is now pushing down on the water outside the straw harder than the air in the straw is pushing down on it. So it is effectively pushes down and up the straw. So you're utilizing the fact that you're reducing the pressure inside by removing particles. And this nicely demonstrates the NP relationship where the number of particles is reduced and the pressure is reduced. Let's talk about the can crush. So in this case, you took uh, a can uh, that was filled with very hot gas, you flipped it upside down into cold ice water. So I'm gonna show this as kind of a, a one-step thing here. You, you may have seen a model that's like before versus after. But if I just wanna show the ice bath here, here's our ice bath. You know, you have your ice cubes and whatnot, very cold water. And you flip the can where it's closed on the top now and the opening is down here. Okay, so that's like our can. Well, inside the can, we had gas, gas particles. And these gas particles were moving very fast. You, know, you could even show whoosh lines on them if you want. But before, they were in equilibrium with the air. So if I want to show what it was like before, it's that we had pressure pushing out from inside the can and pressure pushing in from outside the can. Now, you might be thinking, hold on a sec. If the gas was hot inside the can, wouldn't it be pushing harder and expand the can? Well, no, because the top was open and exposed to the atmosphere. So actually you had air particles leaving to offset the pressure increase inside. inside. So the pressure ended up staying equal before. But now you flip it and you effectively close off the opening. This is now a closed container because the gas can't really make its way up into the can anymore. So what changes? Well, you dunked it in ice water. So as a result, the gas inside is gonna cool down and it's gonna cool down fast. So you're slowing the gas inside. The temperature is dropping inside the can. What does that do to the particles? Well, it slows them down. It slows them down, slows them down. So now they're not able to hit the walls nearly as often or as hard. So the pressure inside is gonna drop. As temperature drops, pressure drops. And notice we're no longer at equilibrium. The outside air is pushing with more force over area with more pressure than inside. So as a result, the can crushes in. Now it happens to be that the sides are the weak part. So it caves in the sides. It doesn't really cave in down just because that's where the stronger metal is. So this nicely shows the P, a TP relationship. When you drop the temperature inside, the pressure inside drops and the can is crushed. And the last one is breathing. Breathing. So with this, we're, we wanna show kind of the human lungs here. I'll do my best to, to show a uh, human. I always botch this image here. Okay, so there's a nose, there's a person's head, neck. Okay, here's the, okay, that's not too bad. All right, so here's the person's lungs. All right, good enough. 
open the lungs up so you can see the pathway. There. Okay, so what happens when you breathe? Well, you know, you might think, well, you just suck in air and then you blow out air. Well, not really. What really happens is your diaphragm, which is from what I understand down here, it pulls your lungs down. That's what happens when you breathe in. The diaphragm pulls the lungs kind of down and that stretches out your lungs. So when you breathe in, you're really increasing the volume inside your lungs via your diaphragm. So what does that do? Well, with more space, the particles now hit the walls less often per area, right? They're moving at the same speed and the same number of them, but since there's now more surface area, the pressure inside is dropping. So as a result, the, again, the pressure inside your lungs drops and we end up with, uh, with the atmosphere effectively correcting this by forcing air into your lungs to offset it. So that's how you breathe in. How do you breathe out? The exact opposite happens. Your diaphragm moves back, shrinking your lungs down. So the volume of your lungs drops. All of a sudden you have the same number of particles moving at the same speed, but the walls are closer, which means you're gonna have more collisions. So the pressure increases. And since you now have higher pressure in your lungs, that higher pressure air is going to be forced out of your lungs into the atmosphere. And that's what we call exhaling. So that shows how uh, a volume change will affect a, a pressure change. And that does it for those 10. Let's do number 11, which I even told you a, a hint at the end. This is a dimensional analysis problem, aka conversion factors. This is not a gas law problem. Remember, dimensional analysis or conversion factors is a skill that we're going to be using all year long. So it's important that you know this. Methane, CH4, is a natural gas that's utilized as an oil alternative. When it undergoes combustion, it reacts as follows. So you can see the equation there. Don't be thrown off by the fact that we haven't done chemical equations like this. You can still figure this one out. A student decides to combust 32.0 grams of methane in the lab. Once he uses knowledge of dimensional analysis to calculate the volume of CO2 that can be produced. He knows that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules has a mass of 16.0 grams. In fact, you could have worked that one out because we know that that's one mole. And if you look on the periodic table, CH4, essentially 12 plus 1111, that's 16. And one molecule of CH4 produces one molecule of CO2. You can see that here, where one of these produces one of these. He also knows that three molecules of CO2 have a mass of 2.19 times 10 to the negative 22nd grams, and that the density of CO2 at this temperature is 1.13 grams per liter. What volume in liters of CO2 can be produced from 32.0 grams of CH4? So this is really a conversion factor problem. Our starting point is 32.0 grams of CH4, and we're looking to turn that into liters. So what can we do with our grams first? Well, it tells you that 16 grams, uh, that's where we wrote this. Here we go. This many molecules has a mass of 16 grams. So we can turn grams into molecules. So 6.022, times 10 to the 23rd molecules per 16.0 grams. Grams cancels grams, and now we have molecules. Well, what can we do with molecules? It says here he knows that three molecules of CO2, let me change the color there, three molecules of CO2 has a mass of this. So I'm gonna multiply this by three uh, not three molecules, whoops, times 2.19 times 10 to the negative 22nd grams per three molecules. And that's going to cancel molecules, molecules. What else do we know? Well, we know the density, 1.13 grams per liter. Now, I would strongly encourage you to be able to use density as a conversion factor. And if I see 1.13 grams per liter, 
I can write that as 1.13 grams equals one liter. And I can now use this conversion factor as one liter per 1.13 grams. And notice I can now solve this just like a conversion factor. 32.0 times 6.022 E23 equals, divided by 16, don't forget that, equals, times 2.19, times 10 to the negative 22nd equals, divided by three equals, divided by 1.13. I get a final answer. Checking all my sig figs, looks like three. My answer is 77.8 liters. Okay, that's how we do it.